I had some thoughts, notes that I thought I might be prompted to use tonight. But I'm not sure about what things that have been brought to my attention tonight may take precedence. So if the Lord's willing, I should like to talk to you now just a few minutes in this great conference. I had a, a lesson years ago as to the greatness of priesthood. It had to do with uh, the call of the First Presidency for me to come to their office on a day that I shall never forget, April 20th, 1935. I was then a commissioner in Salt Lake City. I was a stake president. We had been wrestling with this question of uh, welfare. There were no government work programs. Finances of the church were low. We were told that there wasn't much that could be done so far as the finances of the church were concerned. And here we were with uh, 4,800 of our 7,300 people who would, uh, were wholly or partially dependent. We, only, we had only one, where, one place to go, and that was to the Lord, to apply his program. It was from our humble efforts that uh, the First Presidency, knowing that we'd had some experience, called me one morning if I'd come to the First Presidency's office. It was Saturday morning. There were no calls on their calendar. And for a, uh, hours in that forenoon, they talked with me and told me that they, they wanted me to resign from the city commission and they would release me from being stake president, that I, they wished me to now head up the welfare movement to turn the tide from government relief, uh, direct relief, and help to put the church in a position where it could take care of its own needy. After that uh, morning, I got in my car. It was spring was just breaking. I drove up to the head of City Creek Canyon to what was then called Rotary Park. And there, all by myself, I kneeled down in one of the most humble prayers. Here I was, just a young man in my early 30s. My experience had been limited. I was born in a little country town in Idaho. I had hardly been outside of the, the boundaries of the state of Utah and Idaho. And now to put me in a position where I was to, to reach out to the entire membership of the church worldwide was one of the most staggering contemplations that I could imagine. How could I do it? with my limited understanding. As I kneeled down and my petition was, what kind of an organization should be set up in order to accomplish what the presidency had assigned? And there came to me in that glorious morning one of the most heavenly realizations of the power of the priesthood of God. It was as though something were saying to me, there is no new organization necessary to take care of the needs of this people. All that's necessary is to put the priesthood of God to work. There is nothing else that you need as a substitute. With that understanding then, and with the simple application of the power of the priesthood, the welfare program has gone forward now by leaps and bounds, overcoming obstacles that seemed impossible. Until now, it stand as a stands as a monument to the power of the priesthood, the like of which I could only glimpse 
in those days to which I have made reference. Now, with that understanding of priesthood power, let me then speak of a few other matters that have come to my mind tonight. There are two scriptures that I would have you think of as applicable today, as they were in the period following the advent of the Savior in the meridian of times, in the post-apostolic period. In the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostle Paul gave these charges to the elders of Israel. He said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. And then the, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ into another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and per would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that we have received, let him be accursed. For I certify unto you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me was not of man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught of it, but by the revelations of God. Now today those warnings are just as applicable as they were in the day that they were given by the Apostle Paul. There are some as wolves among us. By that I mean some who profess membership in this church who are not sparing the flock. And among our own membership, arise, men are rising up speaking perverse things. Now perverse means diverting them from the right or correct and being obstinate in the wrong willfully in order to draw the weak and unwary members of the church away from them. And as the Apostle Paul said, it's likewise a marvel to us today, as it was in that day, that some members are so soon removed from those who taught them the gospel and remove them from the true teaching to the gospel of Christ to be led astray into something that corrupts the true doctrines of the gospel of Christ into vicious and wicked practices and performances. These, as, as have been evidenced by shocking events among some of these splinter groups, have been accursed, as the prophets warned, and they are obviously in the power of that evil who feeds the gullible with all the sophistries with which Satan has employed since the beginning of time. Now I should like to make reference to some of these. The first to which I'd make reference is the spread of rumor or gossip. We've mentioned this before. When once one starts, it gains momentum as each telling becomes more fanciful until unwittingly those who wish to dwell on the sensational repeat them in firesides, in classes, in Relief Society gatherings, in priesthood quorum classes, without first verifying the source before becoming a party to causing speculation and discussion which steals away the things which would be from the things that would be more profitable and beneficial and enlightening to their soul. Now, just an example. I understand that there's been a widely circulated story that I was alleged to have had a patriarchal blessing. I don't know whether any of you have heard about that. And that had to do with the coming of the Savior in the ten tribes of Israel. Well, now, in the first place, a patriarchal blessing is a sacred document to the person who has received it and is never given for publication as all patriarchal blessings should be kept as a private possession to the one who has received it. And second, with reference to that which I have alleged to have had, suffice to say that such a quotation is incorrect and without foundation on fact. The thing that shocks me when I have learned in some instances those who have heard these rumors are disappointed when I tell them it's not so. <laughs> they, they seem to have enjoyed believing the rumor without substance of fact. 
Now, I earnestly urge that no such idle gossip be spread abroad without making certain as to whether or not it's true. Now, the first presidency in August, way back in 1913, issued a warning of members of the church which could bear repeating. Let me read you a few things that were said, well, that were said then. To the officers and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, from the day of Hiram Page, Doctrine and Covenants, section 28, at different periods there have been manifestations from delusive spirits to members of the church. Some of these have come to men and women who, because of transgression, became easy prey of the arch deceiver. At other times, these people who pride themselves on their strict observance of the rules and ordinances and ceremonies of the church are led astray by false spirits who exercise an influence so imitative of that which proceeds from a divine source that even these persons who think they are the very elect find it difficult to discern the essential difference. Satan himself has transformed himself to be apparently an angel of light. When visions, dreams, tongues, prophecies, impressions, or an extraordinary gift of inspiration conveys something out of harmony with the accepted revelations of the Church, or contrary to the decisions of its constituted authorities, Latter-day Saints may know that it is not of God, no matter how plausible it may appear. Also, they should understand that directions for the guidance of the Church will come by revelations through the heads of the Church. All faithful members are entitled to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for themselves their families, and for those over whom they are appointed and ordained to preside. But anything at discord with that which comes from God through the head of the Church is not to be received as authoritative or reliable. In secular as well as spiritual affairs, saints may receive divine guidance and revelation affecting themselves, but this does not convey authority to direct others and is not to be accepted when contrary to Church covenants doctrine or discipline, or to known facts, demonstrated truths, or to common sense. No person has the right to induce his fellow members of the Church to engage in speculations or to take stock in ventures of any kind on a specious claim of divine revelation or vision or dream, especially when it's in opposition to the voice of recognized authority, local or general. It is not governed by individual gifts or manifestations, but by the order of the power of the holy priesthood as sustained by the voice and vote of the Church in its appointed conferences. The history of the Church records many pretended revelations by impostors or zealots who believed in the manifestations they sought to lead other people to accept, and in every instant disappointment, sorrow, and disaster have resulted therefrom. Financial loss and sometimes utter ruin have followed. Now, this is something that's reoccurring time and time again, and we call upon you, holders of the priesthood, to stamp out any such and to set to, to flight all such things as are creeping up. People rising up here and there have had some marvelous kind of a manifestation to try to lead the purpose people in a course that hasn't been dictated from the heads of the church. As I say, it never ceases to amaze me how gullible some of our church members are in broadcasting these sensational stories or dreams or visions, purported and alleged to have been given to church leaders past and present, supposedly from some person's private diary, without first verifying the report with proper church authorities. If our people want to be safely guided during these troublous times of deceit and false rumors, they must follow their leaders and seek for the guidance of the Spirit of the Lord in order to avoid falling prey to clever manipulators who, with cunning sophistry, seek to draw attention and gain a following to serve their own notions and sometimes sinister motives. The Lord has very plainly set forth a test by which anyone may challenge any and all who may come claiming clandestinely to have received some kind of priesthood authority. Now, this is what the Lord said in the 42nd section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 11. And I say unto you, 
that it shall not be given to anyone to go forth to preach my gospel or to build up my church, except he be ordained by someone who has authority, and it is known to the church that he has authority and has been regularly ordained by the heads of the church. Now if one comes claiming that he has authority, ask him, where did you get your authority? Have you been ordained by someone who has, had, has authority, who is known to the church that he had authority, and he's been regularly ordained by the heads of the church? If the answer is no, then you may know he's, he's an imposter. This is the test that our people should always apply when some imposter comes trying to lead them astray. Now there's another danger that confronts us. There seems to be those among us who are as wolves in the flock trying to lead some who are weak and unwary among church members. According to reports which have reached us, <clears throat> we're taking the law into their own hands by refusing to pay their income tax because they have some political disagreement with constituted authorities. Others have tried to marshal civilians without police authority <clears throat> and arm themselves to battle against possible dangers little realizing that in so doing, they themselves become the ones who by obstructing the constituted authority would themselves be subject to arrest and imprisonment. We've even heard of someone claiming church membership in protest against pornographic pictures being displayed in theaters have planted bombs and must therefore become subject to punishment by the law and subsequently must stand judgment before the disciplinary bodies of the church. While we must stand solidly behind those who are trying to stamp out the filthy and provocative display of so-called pornographic materials, we have but one answer to all those who thus take such radical measures, and this is the word of the Lord. Let no man think he is ruler, but let God rule him that judgeth according to the counsel of his own will, or in other words, him that counseleth or sitteth upon the judgment seat. Let no man break the laws of the land until he reigns whose right it is to reign and subdues all enemies under his feet. I read that from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 58. Now I want to warn this great body of priesthood against that great sin of Sodom and Gomorrah, which has been labeled as a sin second only in seriousness to the sin of mur murder. I speak of the sin of adultery, and which, as you know, was the label used by the master is referred to unlicensed sexual sins of fornication and adultery, and besides this, the equally grievous sin of homosexuality, which seems to be gaining momentum with social acceptance in the Babylon of the world, and of which church members must not be a party. While we are in the world, we must not be of the world. Any attempts being made by the schools or places of entertainment to flaunt sexual perversions, which can do nothing but excite to the experimentation, must find upon the priesthood of this church a vigorous and unrelenting defense through every lawful means which can be employed. Now the common judges of Israel, our bishops and stake presidents, must not stand by and fail to apply the disciplinary measures within their jurisdiction as set forth plainly in the laws of the Lord, and procedures as set forth in plain and simple instructions that cannot be misunderstood. Never must we allow supposed mercy to the unrepentant sinner to rob justice by which true repentance from sinful practice is predicated. Now finally, one more matter. There are among us many loose writings predicting the calamities which are about to overtake us. Some of these have been publicized as though they were necessary to work up the world to the horrors about to overtake us. Many of these are from sources upon which there cannot be unquestioned reliance. Are you priesthood bearers aware of the fact that we need no such publications to be forewarned if we were only conversant with what the scriptures have already spoken out to, office, to us in plainness? Let me give you the sure word of prophecy on which you should rely for your guide instead of these strange sources which may have great political implications. 
Read the 24th chapter of the book of Matthew, particularly the inspired version as contained in the Pearl of Great Price. Then read the 45th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, where the Lord, not man, had documented the signs of the time. Now turn to section 101, section 133 of the Doctrine and Covenants, and hear the step-by-step -step recounting of events leading up to the coming of the Savior. Finally, turn to the promises the Lord makes to those who keep the commandments when these judgments descend upon the wicked, as set forth uh, in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 38. Now these are some. Brethren, these are the writings with which you should concern yourself rather than commentaries that may come from those whose information may not be the most reliable and whose motives may be subject to question. And may I say parenthetically, most of such writers are not handicapped by having any authentic information on their writings. <laughs> As the Lord has admonished priesthood bearers from the beginning, wherefore gird up your loins and be prepared. Behold, the kingdom is yours, and the enemy shall not overcome. Verily I say unto you that are clean, but not all, that ye are clean, but not all. For there is none else with him whom I am well pleased, for all flesh is corrupted before me. And the powers of darkness prevail upon the earth among the children of men in the presence of all the hosts of heaven, which cause silence to reign, and all eternity is pain. Now, brethren, I have spoken plainly to you in this priesthood session. Let what has been said by all the brethren tonight and in this conference not fall on deaf ears. Let these admonitions be received as the Lord directed they should be received in an early revelation, uh, to which President Tanner has already made, made reference, in all patience and faith, as if from the Lord's own mouth. Only by so doing can we be truly one as a body of priesthood, by following the leadership which the Lord has established in our day in order that we may be one, and he warns us if we are not one, we are not his, as he has declared in the Doctrine and Covenants. Now, one or two things I should like to say about myself and this present responsibility. Never had I thought of myself as one day becoming the president of the church. As a boy in my little country ward, I used to hear the brethren talk about a pillar in the church. I wondered what in the world it meant. It must be something great to be a pillar in the church. Well, now, maybe I'm beginning to realize something about what that means. But I know this, that those who try to guess ahead of time as to who's going to be the next president of the church or just gambling as they might be on a horse race, because only the Lord has the timetables. I remember one time President Charles A. Callis in a council meeting was rather spirited on some question. One of the brethren said, you better listen to Brother George Albert Smith, the president of the Twelve, because he'll, he may be the next president of the church. Brother Callis smiled and said, oh, I wouldn't be too sure. Three times in my life I chose the next president of the church, and all three of them died before they came to the presidency. <laughs> the Lord only knows, and for us to speculate or to presume is not pleasing in the sight of the Lord. I, I have this other thought that I should like to express. Brigham Young, who was a great defender of the prophet Joseph Smith, there were Judases in the ranks in that day, just as there were in the Savior's day, and just as we have today. Some who are members of the church, who are undercutting us, who are, who are betraying their trust. We're shocked as we see the places from which some of these things come. Brigham Young was invited by some of these uh, men who are trying to depose the, the prophet Joseph from his position as president of the church. But they made the mistake of, call, of inviting President Brigham Young into the circle. And after he'd listened to what their motives were, he said to them, I want to say something to you men. You cannot destroy the appointment of a prophet of God, but you can cut the thread that binds you to the prophet of God and sink yourselves to hell. 
And there was a pugilist there by the name of Jacob Bump. And he doubled up his fist and he started towards President Young and he said, I'd like to lay hands on a man like you in, in defense of the Prophet Joseph Smith. Remember that, brethren. You cannot destroy the appointments of the prophets of God. The Lord knows whom he wants to preside in his church. And sometimes it takes a lot of, of practicing, guiding, testing before he may know whether or not one of us is prepared for the present assignment. Now, I think it's folly for, uh, for one to, be, to compare one president of the church with another. Every president of the church, no one takes the place of another president of the church. Each president has his own place. I had a lesson taught me some years ago when in company with one of the brethren, I had reorganized the, the presidency of the Ensign State. We named the bishop of one of the wards. It was near the end of the year, and he elected to remain as bishop along with his first counselor, who was a bishop, until they could close the books at the end of the year. Six weeks after they were sustained, this man suddenly passed away. And then I received, began to receive a barrage of letters. Where in the world was the inspiration for you to call a man that the Lord was going to let die in six weeks? And they invited me to talk at his service as though they were putting me on the spot to try to explain why I would have appointed a man that the Lord was going to take home in six weeks. President Joseph Fielding Smith sat on the stand and heard my attempts to satisfy these people, and he said to me, don't you let that bother you. If you had called a man to a position in this church and he died the next day, that position would have a bearing on what he'll be called to do when he leaves this earth. I believe that. I believe that every president of this church, every apostle of this church, every bishop, every state president who holds a presiding position will have a bearing on what he's called to do when he leaves this earth. And so when you think of one president taking the place of another, he doesn't. That president maintains his own place. We shouldn't try to compare one as being greater than this or greater than the other because each one was great in his own time. And there was no one in the Lord's eyes that had a greater calling than when that man was called to be the president of the church. You can be sure of that. Now, just one final thought. I sat in a class in Sunday school up in my ward one day, and a, the teacher was the son of a patriarch. He said he used to take the lesson of the blessings of his father, and he noticed that the father gave what he called iffy blessings. He would be, give a blessing that it was predicated if you will not do this or if you'll cease doing that. And I watched uh, these men to whom my father gave the iffy blessings. And I saw that many of them didn't heed the warning that my father as patriarch had given. And the blessings were never given and never received because they didn't comply. You know, that started me thinking. I went back into the Doctrine and Covenants and began to read the iffy revelations that had been given to the various brethren in the church. <laughs> if you want to have an exercise and something that will startle you, you read the, the, some of the warnings that were given to the Prophet Joseph Smith, that were given to Thomas B. Marsh, that were given to Martin Harris, that were given to some of the Whitmer boys that were given to William E. McClellan. The warnings which if they'd, would they, had they heeded, they wouldn't have fallen by the wayside. But because they didn't heed and they didn't clear up their lives, they fell by the wayside and some had to be dropped from membership in the church. Now there's one thing that I think should, that we all should be mindful of. I was in the, with a group of missionaries in the temple one day and a question was asked by one of the sisters about the word of wisdom. That the promise was made if one would keep the word of wisdom, they should run and not be weary and should walk and not faint. And she said, uh, now 
How could that promise be realized if a person was crippled? How could they receive the blessing that they could run and not be weary and walk and not faint if they were crippled? And I said to you, did you ever doubt the Lord? The Lord said that. And the trouble with us today, there's too many of us that put question marks instead of periods after what the Lord says. <laughs> now I want you to think about that. We shouldn't be concerned about why he said it or whether or not it can be made so. Just trust the Lord. We don't try to find the answers or explanations. We don't try to spend time explaining what the Lord didn't see fit to explain. We spend useless time. If you would teach our people to put periods, not question marks, after what the Lord has declared and say, that's enough for me to know that that's what the Lord said. Elder Hinckley said something, a story that he told after going down into Vietnam that to me was a great lesson. This was a young boy, as I remember, Brother Hinckley was down from Vietnam. He was a military boy. He joined the church and was now about to go back to his home. And Brother Hinckley said, well, what's, what's it going to do to you when you get back home now that you've joined the church? Oh, said the boy, I'd be cast out. My family would disown me. I'd have difficulty in school. I'd have uh, no military rank. Well, Elder Hinksy said, well, isn't that a pretty big price to pay? And this boy looked at Elder Hinckley and said, well, the gospel's true, isn't it? That was a soul-searching question to Brother Hinckley. Brother Hinckley said, yes, my boy, with all my soul, the gospel's true. And then this young man said, well, what else matters then? If the gospel's true, what else matters? Brethren of the priesthood, if the gospel of Jesus Christ is true, and it is true, what else matters? The Lord may bless us with that rock-bottom testimony that will guide us through all the perils of life when we'll just continue to say to ourselves, because I know the gospel is true, Nothing else matters. I bear you my solemn witness that it is true that the Lord is in his heavens. He's closer to us than you have any idea. You ask of how when the Lord received or gave the last revelation to this church, the Lord is giving revelations day by day. And you're, you will witness and look back at this period and see some of the mighty revelations that the Lord has given in your day and time. To that I bear you solemn witness and leave you my testimony this night. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen.